Hello, friends. Tis I, Amber Magnolia Hill. Welcome to the Medicine Stories podcast. I'm really excited to be back at it after taking some much needed time off over the holidays. Uh, we had a great Christmas. Christmas is so fun when you have kids, and I just really relaxed and like didn't even check my email for like a week, and it felt so good. You know, no matter how you feel about the holidays, I hope that your life enables you to take some time out of time for at least a little while, step outside the the linear time race that we're all in, and just be. Um, but I'm also equally stoked to be back at it and to be here in front of my computer working on and getting this very special episode out to you. Today's guest is Amy, also known as Maya Woodruff. She's a mother, craftswoman, a soon-to-be flower farmer. Uh, we don't talk about that in this interview, but you can follow her on Instagram at Daughter of the Sun to watch that unfold. And the founder and organizer of the Spirit Weavers Gathering. If you don't know about Spirit Weavers, um, you know you can find their website. Find them on Instagram. Uh, it's a big women's gathering that now happens twice a year. It was once a year for a while. Coming up on the sixth year now in 2018. And if you're listening to this podcast in the first couple days it's released, then you might be interested to know that tickets for Spirit Weavers will go on sale on January 11th. Um, they sell out within minutes, literally within minutes. So if you're interested, um, they're going to go on sale at 10 a.m. on Thursday, January 11th. You can go to their website and click register to find out more. Um, we don't really talk about Spirit Weavers a little bit at the end here, but I wanted to share a little bit of, of my story with it. So it, it's cool to watch that now it sells out within minutes because the second year it happened, I remember Amy posted on Facebook, like, we we still want to get some more women down here. Like, it's, it's next week and um, there's still spaces available. So if, if you're really feeling called to come, get in touch with me. And, you know, I'd been seeing it advertised and just been kind of like hesitant and skeptical and not sure what it was all about. And but when I saw that, I was like, OK, OK, you know, I do want to go. And I got in touch with her and she helped me get down there. And other friends helped me get down there, too, with carpooling and child care. And six days later, I was in the desert and Joshua Tree. Um, the location has changed a few times and they now have purchased land in Southern Oregon where the gathering is held. And we talk about that at the end of this episode. But it's just so neat to watch it go from <laughs> help, we need to fill spaces to selling out so many hundreds of tickets uh, within minutes. And for me, let's see, that was 2014. It was just activating. I, I keep coming back to that word when I think about what the first Spirit Weavers was for me. Uh, all these women together and Joshua Tree, the classes I took, um, just the sort of intentional way that we were all coming together, it, it just activated something in me and woke something up and it really changed my life. And then of course the connections I made and and the the friends and uh, you know, that aspect of it has just been huge and influenced my life in so many ways too. And it, one of the things that activated in me was a desire to teach and to put myself out there. And so I applied to teach in 2015 when the gathering moved to Mendocino. And my application was accepted. And I taught two classes there that year. I think they were called Medicine of the Forest and Womb Love and Your Ancient Lineage. So all stuff that we're talking about now on this podcast. And um, it was really scary for me to step out and do that. You know, I <laughs> always been kind of shy and just don't like having a lot of attention on me. Um, and it was so scary, but I've just always tried to live by this Eleanor Roosevelt quote, you must do the thing you think you cannot do. You must do the thing you think you cannot do. And I've learned that those things that scare us the most are are always the things that are calling us the most. And they're calling us because they're our calling. And 
so I just I'm very appreciative of of this gathering that Amy has created and the way it's allowed so many women to step into their calling in a really safe, super supportive and accepting atmosphere. So yeah, check it out if you if you don't know about it yet. It's um it works for me. It's worked wonders in my life and so many women that I know as well. And even if you can't make it, just the, the um, you know, learning about the teachers who are teaching there and following their posts on Instagram and all of that has really been inspiring for me too. So the beginning of this episode, the connection's a little spotty. It's just for a couple minutes and it's not that bad. And um, there's also quite a few rooster crowings in the background over over in Amy's end of things in Hawaii, and even some very vigorous uh, donkey brain at one point. So just know that she's on a farm over there. Um, we talk about Amy's experience with Amanita Muscaria at one point during this interview. And so I thought that this intro would be a good place for me to share something that I said I would share in my very first episode, the short 10 minute overall intro, this is what this podcast is about episode. I said that at some point I would share the story of the psilocybin experience I had at age 16 that changed my life. And I I didn't know it was gonna change my life. I didn't know that was gonna happen. And as we talk about in the interview, psilocybin mushrooms and amanita mushrooms are quite different and they work quite differently. But they are both psychedelic. And I also want to talk about the word psychedelic. I did say this briefly in episode four with Asia Suler. Um, But people have a whole lot of feelings about psychedelics, right? Um, Since that episode has come out, I've had a few people writing me be like, I had the worst experience on psychedelics. And I, I can't believe you're talking about them. And I'm like, well, yeah, I'm, I'm sure you did because set and setting and so many other things are super important. They're not party drugs. It's not something you can just take without being prepared for what's going to happen and having a very, very safe container and some integration techniques for when it's all over. Um, but of course, most of us do take them like that. We think of them as party drugs. And I got really lucky this time when I was 16, because that's what I was thinking. Like, you know, I was drinking alcohol and smoking weed. And I was like, cool, we're shrooming, you know, and it was just me and two girlfriends. And we were at one of their homes um, and her parents were gone. And so we were in a safe space. We were in a safe container for when it really kicked in and became like a high intensity mystical experience. Um, we were safe enough to experience the the very positive effects of that. So what happened was that we had like taken some mushrooms earlier in the day. It was January, so there was snow outside. It was really beautiful. And it was just kind of fun. It was kind of like a body high. We laughed a lot. We kind of ran around our house. And as evening fell, for some reason, we were like, let's take more mushrooms. And we drove to this local pizza place in South Lake Tahoe in the 90s called Nick and Willie's and got more mushrooms from our friend who we had gotten the first batch from. And we took them and... (laughs) I just had no, no idea what I was doing, clearly. Um, So I remember we were in my friend's parents' hot tub, and on the railing was this, like, couple-inch high dusting of snow. And I was looking at it, and it was so beautiful. So this is when the trip really came on. I was suddenly like, what the fuck? Like, snow is so amazing. Frozen water is so amazing. Just really mesmerized by it. I think snow was falling too. And then looking up in the sky at the snow falling and just feeling this intense appreciation. And then we went inside and her parents' bedroom closet had like big mirrors on it. And I was wearing my friend's bathing suit. I remember looking in the mirror and being like, what the fuck? This is what I look like. And so this is why you shouldn't look in a mirror on psychedelics and it wasn't even like i'm fat or gross or anything it was like my body is so bodies are so weird oh my god what's happening to my eyes they're like falling outward from my face my nose is contracting like it was just really weird and i started getting really panicked and really scared which is something that really commonly happens with psychedelics right and my friend brought me some of her pajamas and i remember it was this uh red plaid 
pants and a green Adidas shirt. And I had seen her wear these pajamas so many times. I have like a photo of her wearing them at my 12th birthday party or maybe 13th, I don't know, some birthday party. And I put them on and it just immediately changed everything because I associated them with her so clearly and because I felt comfy and, you know, I wasn't in like a tight, wet bathing suit anymore. Um, It really changed how I felt, just changing like that tactile sensation that I was experiencing. And then the three of us sat in a little circle and that's when it became really ecstatic. It kind of washed over all of us at the same time. And we were like crying, you know, tears streaming down our faces, and just like expressing so much love for each other and love for everyone. I remember thinking about my parents and my boyfriend and thinking like, well, everyone I love like exists all the time, even when they're not in the room with me. Like that seemed like a revelation for me at that time, like really thinking, what are they doing right now? I hope they know how much I love them right now. And it was like my mind was kind of cast out into the entire cosmos. It was very cosmic, like like interstellar space cosmic. But at the same time, I was like inhabiting the tiniest spaces within my own body. Um, it, it's impossible to talk about. Ineffability is one of the hallmarks of a true mystical slash psychedelic experience. Not all psychedelic experiences are mystical, but many of them are. And this is really like a... a thing that scholars of mysticism and of religious experience study. There's like a scale of certain things that you check off to be like, yep, that was a mystical experience. And a lot of psychedelic experiences meet that criteria. And this was one of them. Um, And I was so in love with my body. I just remember looking down at it and being like, this is sacred. This, like, this is the container that will carry me through this life. You know, fuck all my body issues and all the reasons that I have to hate it or that I think I should hate it. This is sacred and so beautiful. And these women, oh girls, we were 16 that I'm with are are so beautiful and amazing and just are just effused with love. Um and and I just had this really deep sense that everything would always be okay even death even death and we thought we were dead we i remember saying like ali it's going to be so sad when your parents come home and just find us dead here in the game room <laughs> you know <laughs> like imagine what it was going to be like when they called my parents and cuz we were just beyond anything that we knew was possible to experience um and you know i did feel relief as we started coming down like realizing okay that that's a temporary thing what we just went through is temporary and it's fading already but i'm so so grateful for the lessons i learned and especially that deep abiding sense that everything is okay even death and uh, this reminds me of uh ramdas says dying is absolutely safe and i i think i really felt that and really integrated that that night And I think that another thing that night did was really open up my curiosity in life. You know, at that point, I had just been eating processed foods and watching limitless hours of television. Uh, That's like all I did when I was home was watch TV. And my creativity had been dulled also through compulsory schooling, you know, and just always being told that I wasn't good enough at what I was doing. Um, I had just become kind of a shell of a person I mean I was I was happy I had a good family I I liked my little town and my friends but I I had lost my curiosity and my confidence and that night really helped to bring it back on just a deep level that has like continued with me throughout my life ever since then and so that was 97 um I really, I really didn't know how to integrate what had happened. There was no way to integrate it. I didn't have the tools to do that. I didn't know anything. And I'm, I'm so grateful now that we are living in a time where there's so much research and information out there now about how to have safe, sacred, therapeutic, psychedelic journeys. Again, I'm going to invoke my friend Jim Fadiman and his book, The Psychedelic Explorer's Guide. He will be a guest coming up soon. Um, What I did find soon afterwards, though, was this website called The Vaults of Arrowhead. It's still out there. I think it's arrowhead.org. I ended up meeting the founders, Earth and Fire are their names, at the Psychedelic Science Conference in 2013. And it turns out they live by me now. But it really saved me. This was the early days of the internet. And when we got the internet and a 
personal computer in my house probably the next year like the first thing I did was get online and try to figure out what had happened to me that night what do mushrooms do to people what do psychedelics do to people what does this mean and uh, Arrowwood really helped me make sense of what I went through and I wish I had had these tools of integration and preparation before that night but I'm looking back I'm glad it all went down the way it did because it was really life-changing and that's why I talk about psychedelics now. That's why that's going to be a focus of this podcast um, with some guests, you know, not all of them, but some of them. And I'm really grateful that Amy was willing to talk with me about Amanita because that is a mushroom, a substance that I have no um, experience with. And it, I loved what she had to say and what she had to teach me. <clears throat> so in the beginning of this episode... I say that my interview with Lara Vesta was going to come out before this one, but I decided to release this one first, um, both to give you a little warning on Spirit Weaver's tickets, but also because I wanted this to come out closer to the birthday of Amy's friend Cherie, whose death, whose murder we speak about um, for most of this interview. So it's just I just want to be a little closer to the, the time that we interviewed it. And also, uh, in Lara's interview, which will now be coming out next week, she and I talk about the mother line. And that is kind of how Amy and I open this episode is by naming our ancestors, naming our grandmothers, uh, speaking their names out loud. I really loved this practice. I loved that Amy suggested we do it. And I hope it's something that you um, do for yourself, are feeling inspired to do after you listen to this. You can write it out or speak it out or do it with friends, or do it at the next like gathering you facilitate, or whatever. But it's a really powerful way to self-identify and to connect with your ancestors by speaking their names and going back in time, generation by generation, tracing your lineage, acknowledging each of these people by speaking their names. I also love a little farther into the interview um, Amy speaks about this practice that she learned from Havani Rios of like another way to name your lineage is to name the land that raised you. So based on how Amy named her land lineage, I'm going to speak mine right now, which is that I am Amber. I grew up in Lake Tahoe on land that was originally inhabited by the Washoe people on the Lake Tahoe watershed, you know, my water came from the lake and the Truckee River and a number of small rivers and streams that come through Lake Tahoe. And the mountains that raised me were the High Sierra, the the High Sierra. You know, I love, I live in the Sierra foothills now, but Lake Tahoe is a basin in the High Sierra. And the trees that raised me were the pines, mostly the Jeffrey Pines and the dominant plants in the landscape was uh, sagebrush, Artemisia tridentata, which is in the same family as mugwort, one of my favorite plants. And I don't know if we've talked about mugwort on the podcast yet, but I have a lot written about it on my website at mythicmedicine.love. So I love that way of naming your lineage and thinking about who you are um, and self-identifying as well. And and encourage you to write that out for yourself too. What's the land that that raised you? The uh, the native peoples, if there are some, the waterways, the mountains, or whatever the landscape is there. Um, the dominating plants, maybe the animals, bears. The bears raised me there in Tahoe too. And if you like what Amy and I talk about here, we did an extra conversation on Patreon um, where we just we dive more into ancestry and to what it was that initially sparked Amy's desire to find her ancestors because she really started doing it um, well before it was trendy. And it was it was a breakup that inspired her to she wanted to move through the breakup quickly and not be mired in the pain of it. And she realized she needed to know who she was in order to do that and that she needed to know who her ancestors were. And so we talk about that story and we talk about practical tips for finding and connecting with your ancestors. So like if you haven't done that and you want to, that Patreon interview audio MP3 would be a good starting point for you. Um, it's at the $2 a month level, so really easy to access. 
patreon.com slash medicine stories. Also have a bonus from Asia Suler there. Going to have an upcoming bonus from Lara Vesta and a lot more. It's been really fun thinking about like how I can thank my Patreon supporters at the most uh, basic level, the $2 level. There are higher levels that you can become a patron at, and there's even more things you can access there. But I want the $2 level to be where people get the best stuff, so it's the easiest to access. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about what we talk about in this interview, and then we'll get into it. So yeah, Amy's names... Maya, Amy, Patrice, uh, invoking the ancestors by naming them and speaking their names out loud. The heart of this interview and the reason I thought of Amy when I was first coming up with a list of people that I wanted to interview was because she had given me bits of pieces of the story over the years and I wanted to hear it all and I, I knew she had some really good things to offer to people. So Amy shares publicly for the first time, the story of her best friend Cherie's murder when Amy was seven months pregnant and her really incredible, uh, really accelerated grieving and healing process. Uh, Amy and I talk about our journeys with forgiving the people who caused the deaths of our loved ones. And I mean, I I just, I feel like I want to qualify that and say this isn't like some new age like idealizing forgiveness this is like you know a real um i it just for both of us forgiveness was like almost instantaneous it was just the 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 way we truly felt about approaching these people it wasn't like hard or something we felt like we should do it was for both of us just what was going to happen and and how we naturally felt and we speak about that it felt um it's hard to talk about but we talk about it in the interview so i'll stop there and then yeah diving deep with amanita muscaria and the time space collapse that amy has experienced with her medicine Uh, we also both speak about our relationship with cannabis how indigenous women are who we need to be listening to right now And then we talk about Amy's feral childhood. I loved hearing this, like all the crazy foods that her dad and uncles caught for them and how this was just normal for her to be eating snake and frog legs and other wild foods. And uh, Amy's Choctaw and Cherokee ancestors from Oklahoma and the ancestors that she really connects with on that side. And we talk a little bit about the challenges and rewards of founding and running the Spirit Weavers Gathering and purchasing 100 acres in Southern Oregon on which to hold the gathering and other things and um, Amy's work to preserve that land and just how important it is to listen to nature. So... Oh, yes. We talk about this a little bit, too, of course, but there's a song in the middle of the interview. This is the first time I've ever done that by our mutual friend, Alila Diane. And um, I'll let Amy introduce that song to you, but uh, it's kind of fun to be putting some music in here for the first time. Okay, ramble, ramble, getting back into the swing of doing this podcast. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. Um... I'm just like giddy that I'm I'm back, back with the podcast. So let's get into it and let's hear from Amy. Hi, Amy. Hi, Amber. Aloha. Good morning. Aloha. Morning for you, afternoon for me, um, because you're in Hawaii. Let me see. I've got something popping up on my screen. Oh, I see what's happening. Okay. So... I wanted to start, before we get into what we're going to talk about today, um, by asking you about your name, because you you have two different names, and you really seem to use both of them um, equally, and I, it seems like you're really open to both of them, too. And online, you're Amy Maya Woodruff. Um, I first knew you as Amy, and I still tend to call you Amy, but I would love to hear about the names and what they mean to you and how Maya came into your life. Mm. Yeah, and thank you, Amber, for having me here today. I'm so honored to sit with you and just open up and share a little bit. So um, I'll begin with my name, Amy's my birth name. And 
Maya came forth about 10 years ago when we first arrived um, to Kauai. And I think I was just ready for something new. And we had found this book that had translations of names. And so Amy was in there and the translation was Maya. And so I took that on and um, yeah, it's been with me ever since. And I think people who have known me for a long time still call me Maya. And those who have met me within the last 10 years call me Maya. But it's interesting because some of my best friends here on the island um, who I introduced myself as Maya call me Amy. So, um, yeah, and I had something come up like within a year, I think, of using Maya that um, I kind of wondered why I didn't end up going by my middle name, which is Patrice. Um, and so that's another name that I hold really close to me as well. And it's a name that my mom chose after a woman who was really inspiring to her throughout her pregnancy. And um, this woman is actually more like me. I, I haven't met her in the physical. I think maybe when I was a baby I did. Um, but we've just seemed to walk the same path. And I I actually found her through Instagram. And so she's <laughs> my auntie and she's an incredible homesteading woman. And I just love her so much and I look forward to meeting her. So yeah, those three names are kind of the ones that um, are close to my heart. Wow. That's so cool that you found her through Instagram. Um, so speaking of names, you had a great idea when we were first connecting over the idea of doing this interview, which was to open with each of us speaking our pure matrilineal um, ancestral names as far back as we know them. So I love this. And I, I think I told you, yeah, when we were texting about this, like, oh, I love that idea. And I just found like the sixth name in that line. I just mm. found my great, great, great grandmother. And I remember thinking, I wonder if before we talk, I can find the next one. And I did. I found her last Aww. night. Yeah, right. I found a handwritten record that had her name on it. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. It's a big puzzle. It's a never ending puzzle. It's the best kind of puzzle. Yeah, and it's just so fun and so satisfying. You know, if you've never <laughs> traced your genealogy or got into ancestry, then uh, it's a rush that you can look forward to <laughs> once you get mm -hmm. into it. Totally. So, um, yeah, why don't you why don't you begin? Okay, so you you can go back uh, six generations. Yeah, well, it's seven names, including mine. So yeah. Okay, so I can go back uh, ten generations, and it's a lot of names. So why don't we just go into the sixth generation and then we can stop there because um, it, it feels like it can just keep going. <laughs> no, I want to, I want to hear all of them. I want to hear <laughs> okay, all your okay. names. Beautiful. Okay. <laughs> so I am Amy Maya, mother of Naya Atia, daughter of Denny and Denny Woodra. My parents share the same name. Granddaughter of Wyvon and Lena. Great granddaughter of Gertrude. <laughs> oh, they're coming through. <laughs> mm, great granddaughter of Gertrude, Madiki, Cleo, and Irene. Great great granddaughter of Nora, Lucy, Ida, Mary, Catherine, Elizabeth, Ida Jane. Third generation granddaughter of Mary. Eliza, Elizabeth, Sally, Martha, Ivy Jane, Emma, Melissa, Louisa, Evelyn, fourth great granddaughter of Elizabeth, Sarah, Charlotte, Clarissa, Ruth, Almira, Sarah, Mary, Fifth generation granddaughter of Jane, Clarissa, Elizabeth, Susanna. Sixth generation granddaughter of Mary, Rachel, Hannah, Sabia, Lydia, Francis, Margaret. Seventh generation granddaughter of Anne, Elizabeth, Medival, Hannah, 
Sarah, Margaret, eighth generation granddaughter of Rebecca, Catherine, Rhoda, ninth generation granddaughter of Ruth, Catherine, Mary, Thankful, and tenth generation granddaughter of Elizabeth. Thankful. <laughs> wow. My ninth generation <laughs> grandmother, Thankful Woodward, born in 1646. Wow. Well, I was smiling that whole time. Um, it's so powerful to call the names like that. Um, hmm. And I just, I love, love hearing women's names going back in time. Mm-hmm. And it's so interesting. There's so many similar names. Like there, in my family, there's so many Elizabeths and Marys. Mm-hmm. And yeah, just reading through that, you know, some names you can just read and some names just provoke like ooh, so much emotion mm-hmm. inside. And it's so deep. And we're all still so connected to these women and the men. Um, For me, I've just made a strong effort to find all of the women. I haven't yet connected with the men, though I have them all. I just haven't put them together yet. Um, So this is something that I can pass down to Naya and just something that I really hold close to my heart to have these names and their birth dates. And so I'm, I'm excited to hear about your grandmother, Bamber. Yeah, well, so it's interesting because um, what I had done was gone back in my pure maternal line. So mom's, 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 mom. And that's where I can go back um, six generations. But, you know, on my on my all my other lines, I think something that people forget is each generation you go back, the number of ancestors you have doubles. So, Mm -hmm. you you know, it's just it becomes like exponential. (laughs) Um, There's a lot of them. And so, yeah, if I was looking at all my lines, there's so many. And I recently traced back into Scotland in like the 14 or 1500s. So I could go really far back on that line. Mm But um, And I am going to do my my pure maternal line, but you're inspiring me to share something that – so I just – on the episode that will come out before this with Lara Vesta, um, I spoke about a dream I had in which I found a scroll in my bone that had the name William Newton Wright written on it. And something that is really interesting, so I kind of got the message like the scrolls are in my bones and I should keep writing with my right wrist, you know, the last name right was embedded in there. Um, Mm. But I was never quite sure why it was him. And I'm still not sure like any of the rights that it could have been. Why was it his name? And then on Instagram, I posted a very old photo that I found on Ancestry.com and someone had written on it Hezekiah clan and it's my like sixth or seventh grade grandfather Hezekiah bar right and like. 60, 70, 80 family members. Um, yeah, in Arkansas in the 1800s. It's this like very cool old photo. Wow. And so I wrote in that Instagram story um, all the names as I as I know them, and I have them memorized by now going down. So it starts with Hezekiah's dad, Blue John Wright, his son, Hezekiah Barr Wright, his son, William Jasper Wright, his son, William Newton Wright, <laughs> His son, Louis Zelger Wright, who was my great-grandfather, who I knew as a child. And then his daughter, Dathel Inez Wright, who was my grandma with whom I was very close. And then my Mm. dad, Gary Wayne Hill, and then me, Amber Marie Hill. And a number of people wrote back and were like, those names, you know, those are all crazy Mm -hmm. names. And I was like, Mm -hmm. that is so true. That, That is one thing about this line that I had never paid attention to before, but... I love interesting names and I love looking at interesting old names and that basically each name in that line is, has at least one really interesting name in it um, now seems meaningful to me and maybe has something to do with that dream I had. Yeah, I have a William Jasper too. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, and I also have Wright as well. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah, my husband, Owen, is has a ton of family in Arkansas and luckily we haven't found any overlap yet. <laughs> We're like, oh my god, we could really be related. Like, we, we kind of we're look all so connected. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and this is the kind of thing that ancestry nerds do. Uh-huh. <laughs> I I feel like yeah, I think you were one of the first um, people that I connected with. That I'm like, oh, you've done ancestry 
ministry.com too. I think it's, it was a really potent um, opening for healing for me. And I think maybe we started around the same time. Yeah. Well, actually Um, you started a little earlier than me. Yeah. You, I was going to incorporate that into my question later when you told me when you started, I was like, wow, she's really got a head start on all of us here. Yeah. I would love to share about that too. Um, We can share about it now or later. Okay. Well, let me, let me introduce myself and my grandmothers quickly before we move on. So I am Amber. My daughters are my Celia and Nixie. My mother is Janice, daughter of Claire, daughter of Valida, daughter of Obeline, daughter of Julie, and I now know daughter of Alice. Mm. Yeah, I just, I'm just like smiling so big <laughs> thinking mm-hmm. about these names right now and these women and how good it feels to have them here. So, yeah, we're going to get, we're going to get right into, um, what we originally connected over having this podcast about when you were seven months pregnant with your daughter, Naya, who's how old is she now? She's seven. She's seven. Your best friend of 13 years, Cherie was murdered in her home exactly two months before her wedding day. Um, you wrote to me that because I was carrying a child, I was working with life and death all in one moment. And so I had to make a conscious choice to transcend the pain and anger into something healing and beautiful. And I've really seen you do that. Um, we've, we've always connected over Cherie, even though you and I met, I think, I think after this had already happened and you really helped me after my mom's car accident to find some comfort and to know how to grieve and um, just having your words and your love during that time were so important. I could tell that you held wisdom because you have been there and you have been through this. So I I invite you to share Cherie's story, the story of your friendship, the story of her death, anything you would like to say about it. Um, I'm here to listen. Mm, thank you, Amber. And thank you to Cherie for Um, Being born today, today would have been her 42nd birthday. And so I sit with you and I sit with her and just reflect on these memories and of her life. Um, And it's such an honor to just speak her name and bring her here with us. Um, So Shuri and I met when I was 18 and she was 20 and we worked at the mall together. So this is like 1996. Um, (laughs) And she was working at Wet Seal, which this is 20 (laughs) years ago when Wet Seal was cool. Mm -hmm. Um, And I was working at a hair salon across the way. And so we would see each other. And I think just from, you know, Going into the store, we just started talking one day, and she shared that she had just split with her partner, and I had too, and we were like, we should go out sometime and hang out, and so we did, and we just instantly connected so strongly, like never before, and um, we just started spending a lot of time together, and um we moved out about a year after becoming friends. Uh, we moved down to Newport Beach in Southern California. And from the time that we first moved into our first home together until she passed, we had lived in seven different houses together over that course of 13 years. Um, and we always said if we never met our soulmates, um, you know, when you're 20, you're really in defining your soulmate, um, that at least we could be in comfort knowing that we found our soul sisters. And she really was my soul sister. Um, and she still is. And so, yeah, we spent a beautiful 13 years together. And when I met my partner, Augustine, we had moved uh, to New Zealand for a year. And I had gotten pregnant during that time. And so I was really excited to share with her. And I remember the phone call that day. I was on a payphone in New Zealand. I I called her and 
um, to tell her the news. And she was like, I have news too. I'm engaged. And so we both got to celebrate this new life and um, just her engagement. And so we both just had these big moments um, that had been birthed for the both of us. And so I came back to the mainland. Um, I had, we had moved back to Kauai after our year in New Zealand. And I came back to the mainland um, for my blessing way. And um, when I arrived there, Sheree came and stayed with my family for a week. The week before she passed, we were together for about four days. Um, and during my blessing way, we went around and shared sort of how we just did in the beginning about our grandmothers. Um, and each woman kind of spoke a bit about how we had connected and how we came together. And when it came time for Cherie to speak, uh, neither one of us could speak. And I just asked everyone to just take a breath for the two of us because there were really no words to share about the friendship that we held together. Um, and I'm so grateful that we got to experience that moment together because we hadn't seen each other in a year. And so, you know, we were really able to just take that time to look into each other's eyes and take a breath together and see each other and witness each other. And, um, and so I feel like that was just so meant to be that we had spent that time together after not seeing each other for a year. Um, and so she went home and that following week, she, uh, that next Friday, she went with her mom to pick out her wedding dress. And um, they had came home that night. And she had walked her mom out to her car. And her mom lived about an hour away in Riverside. Shree was in Los Angeles at the time in Studio City where she was living with her fiancé. So she walked her mom out to the car and told her mom that she loved her and she'd see her next weekend. And... Um, when she came back in the house, you know, the story's a little bit unclear. Um, but from what we know, she came back in the house and I believe she was in her bathroom cleaning. And there was a transient man, his name was Omar Leora. And he had broken into her house through the back door. She kind of had an alleyway back there and he came inside and he was high on crystal meth. And he, I believe that he came into her house to rob her. And um, he went into her bedroom where her bathroom was. And what I would like to believe was that she scared him because maybe he didn't know that she was there. And um, so he ended up stabbing her to death. And then he set her house on fire. Um, and what happened, forgot about this part, but when she went out to tell her mom goodbye, her fiancé, Adam, had also left at the same time. He was just running to the store really quick. So he was gone for about 20 minutes. And so Adam came home. <clears throat> and when he opened the door, this man, Omar, was still inside. And they struggled, and Omar went out the back door, and Adam chased him. And um, he chased him for a long while, and he couldn't catch him. And he ended up dropping his, uh, what do you, I can't even think of what they are, the, um, the iPod. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, he ended up dropping his iPod, and... That's how they found him, but um, it took a few months. But anyways, Adam came back in the house, and at that point, the police wouldn't let him in. And he didn't even know that Sheree was inside or what had happened. And so he was right away taken in for investigation. Um, and that was on July 24th, 2010, and it was exactly two months um, 
till her wedding. And I was to be her maid of honor. Um, but since I was so far along in my pregnancy, I would have been nine months. I wasn't going to be able to make it to her wedding. Um, and so there, it turned into a glorified Hollywood story, unfortunately, because she was a beautiful young bride who was murdered in her home. And, um, what happened with me was that I was down, I was in Ojai actually, um, with some friends there and the next morning it ha that happened, um, at seven o'clock PM on a Saturday night and I was getting ready to drive up to San Francisco. And luckily Danielle, who's our mutual friend, um, decided to come with me on the drive. And so on Sunday we were driving up to San Francisco and I got a phone call from one of my high school friends who was also a mutual friend of Shuri and I knew that something was wrong because she was calling me and she asked me to call another one of our friends and I knew that it had to do with Shuri and so I pulled over on the side of the road and I called our mutual friend and she had shared with me what had happened and no one wanted to tell me um, because I was pregnant. And so I think that that was really difficult. Um, and I really appreciate that our friend Alicia took the time to, to do that because, you know, that's not something easy to share. And with me being pregnant at the time, I didn't realize how... Um, Actually, I did realize, I think I did realize just to not let it affect Naya and the stress that could come up surrounding it. And so um, she shared with me the news and I drove right up to San Francisco and I stayed at our friend Alyssa's house um, and flew back the next morning. So I was driving up there to pick Augustine up from the airport because he was flying in from Kauai. We were going to meet in San Francisco. And I, I drove um, up there and then flew directly back down to L.A. the next day. And I called my midwives right away. And they were so clear that I could not allow myself to go into stress uh, because I could go into pre-labor. And... So in that, that moment, I had to really make a conscious decision for Naya, for this child that I was carrying. So in, in that moment, I was faced with life and death at the same time. And so there's so much, there's so much uh, that I could share just surrounding even that night um, when I found out that she had passed mm -hmm. and we can go into a little bit about this later, but basically I had been, I had spent the last year in the depths of death and going into death and the fear of death. And so I feel like I was preparing myself for this. And a lot of this was through the teachings of Krishnamurti. And so I happen to have a lot of, his talks on death on my um, phone at the time. And so I went to Sheree's house. I'm sorry. I went to Alyssa's house and put my headphones on and just that whole night I didn't sleep. And I just was listening to his talks on death and um, they have helped me so much. All of his teachings have helped me so much. And so, um, yeah, the next day I flew down to, LA and the midwives were sharing that I couldn't go to any of um, to the vigils or anything that I just needed to be with my family and so that's what I did and it was really really hard for me and I was watching it all on the news which even that they were like don't turn on the news but I couldn't help it I was just I think in shock and like I said, it just turned into this um, Hollywood story, and 
Um, and so my experience through her loss was not, not one of grieving. It was one for me of, I feel like I had to cut through everything so quickly. There wasn't time to hold any pain. There wasn't time to hold any anger. So it was just like right down to the truth of things and really looking at the beauty of death and just how far we've come from death, how, how we see death so far in the distance um, and how we can actually make death a part of our daily lives. And I learned so much through this. And um, I think for me, the biggest thing I knew I had to do was forgive this man. And there was so much pain and anger around me, which rightfully so, you know, from her family and from our friends. And I felt like, as I shared, I had been preparing myself for something like this and just basically cutting through the bullshit. And that's something that can be taken really harsh to a lot of people who have lost loved ones, especially through murder. But for me, that's what I had to tell myself. And that's what helped me get through everything was just going into such compassion for this man and his life. And what was his life like? How did he suffer that allowed himself to do something like this? to another person. And I think that that helped me so much. And um, he has helped me so much. And I don't forget about him on days like this, on Cherie's birthday, because today is also his birthday. And so I think it's important that to speak his name and um, and it's not something that's easy to do, but you know, during that time, I feel like that was the way that was easiest for me to move through this was just to forgive him. Um, and I tried really hard in the beginning when he first was found. So he was from Mexico and um, after this happened, he went back to Mexico and it took, I believe it took about seven months for them to find him. Um, and so once they found him, they had a trial in Los Angeles and he shared that if he could give his life and bring Shri back, he would. Um, so he is in prison um, for the rest of his life. And so I think about Cherie, who is free. You know, she's free of suffering, and she's free of the struggles that we see here on this planet. And he isn't. You know, he's in prison for the rest of his life. And so I think about him, and I have tried to find him in the system. I have his number. You, have, you know, you have your prison number. I've tried to find him because I wanted to write to him. Um, just to share that I have forgiven him. And I think that that could help to bring a lot of um, peace of heart, peace of mind. You know, I'm not sure. And there's a reason why I'm not able to contact him because I've tried multiple times. Um, but I think in situations like this, it's so easy to just turn to the anger and the hate. Um, that's the easy way out. And so I think it's important um, for a lot of us in times like this to really give it our all to see the other side of things. And yes, I'm completely devastated that Sheree was taken from us. Um 
and you know she's no longer here so I think the work is really working with what is still here <sighs> I am um, so many things so many threads that I wanted to follow up on or things I wanted to speak. Uh, the the freedom, the freedom thing that Shri is free now. Um, you you really helped me with that when my mom passed and the Krishna Murti teachings, and that's how I felt too from the moment I heard about it. Like, and even thinking about like the moment of impact, you know, which I can't stop my mind from replaying. Like when I wake up in the middle of the night sometimes, and especially around the anniversary of her death, I just think of it as like this glorious release. Mm. and uh, and everyone in our family felt the same way and her work friends who drove through the same intersection to work every day said the same thing they they would say like it was dark everywhere but there was a beam of light shining right on that spot and when I drive through that intersection I feel this joy and this release and the the forgiveness piece too I that's just I, I really appreciate hearing that story. Um, you know, that's, that's so powerful and it does make the healing so much easier. Um, my sister and I also just immediately forgave the woman who, who hit our mom. And it wasn't really her fault because the lights were out, but some people feel like it still was because like she should have known, she should have been able to tell it was an intersection. And I mean, her life was devastated by this too. This affected her life greatly as well. And it mm -hmm. just, there's just, we, you know, it was really important for us uh, to meet her and to speak with her. And mm. um, I yeah. think that that's it. Yeah. I've, I've had like visions of that as well, of actually going to meet with him and sit with him and look into his eyes. I mean, I really have so much compassion for this man for, I just can't imagine what his life was like, you know, and yeah, there's, it's a lot to carry. Um, and I'm having, I, it's been interesting this week. There was a murder that occurred on Oahu and it was such a similar story of what happened to Shuri. And, um, and it's just interesting that it's, it's coming forth this week. So there's just been a lot of reflection on all of it. And I read a post last night on um, the father um, or the partner of the woman who was murdered on Oahu. And he shared the same thing, that forgiveness. And I think it's like, it's like the pendulum swinging, you know, to the other side of full effect to just, I think it's just like in our innate human DNA, um, the importance of forgiveness. And so it's one of the hardest things to do, but it is so liberating and so freeing <clears throat> and, and helpful in times of challenge. Um, Something else that I want to share really quickly as well is that so Sheree and Omar were, they shared the same exact birthday, the same exact year, and they were born in the same exact county in Riverside County. Wow. They definitely have some karma together, these two. And the other thing that's really interesting is that this was Sheree's fear. She was so afraid of going out at night and, you know, locking the doors. Like I, I was just always so open. I didn't have those same fears, but anyone that knows her knows that she was very um, aware of these sorts of things. So like she would get really creeped out easily by certain people. And yeah, she just didn't like to go out at night. She'd always be locking her doors and just so I've thought about this so much and this is either something that she created or that she already knew yeah. was going to happen. 
Yeah. So I I was thinking of bringing this up about the forgiveness piece. It's always so hard for me to talk about um, like fate and destiny and, you know, the way we're entwined because it it's vague and it's uncertain. But for me, part of the reason um, I wanted to connect with Holly, the woman who hit my mom, is because like she was very entwined in the fate of my mother and of my family. Like we were all mm-hmm. fated together. Um, and she was there when th- th- she was there when she died, you know, like feet mm-hmm. from her or less. And and I, I, my whole life had an extremely deep fear that my mom would die in a car accident coming home from school. Um, and that's exactly coming home from work. And that's exactly what mm-hmm. happened. And she was only a few weeks away from retiring. And when we had talked on the phone a few two days before she died, I said, I can't wait until you're done working and you don't have to make that dangerous drive anymore. Mm. So I think I I see a parallel between what you're saying with Cherie, that there is this almost foreknowing. Mm-hmm. And then there are these outside characters that can come in and like and cause the fateful moment to happen. Mm-hmm. And even though it's devastating and awful, um, it's meaningful. And you we need to like look at the meanings when we are going through such deep grief. Mm -hmm. That is really interesting that they were born, I I knew the same day, but the same year and the same county. Mm -hmm. And then their lives take these very different tracks. Yeah. And come back together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's let's use this moment. I'm gonna do something that I haven't done yet on this show, and play a song by our mutual friend Alila Diane. Um, can you tell us about this song? Yeah. So um, I guess it was maybe several months after Shri had passed. Um, Alila had wrote to me, and she said Shri came to me. She said, this has never happened before. And I was just at the organ playing music and she fully came through and Alila channeled this song. And she said, you know, I've never experienced anything like this before. It just happened. And I'm just delivering this message to you. And it's come through in the form of a song. And I was just like, wow. And I believe that Shri and Alila did meet, um, and so she sent me the song and the song is called the wind and it's on her album. I believe it's the wild divine. Um, so thank you, Alila for being this channel and for just being open to receive this, this beautiful song. Okay. We're going to listen to it.
mentioned that you had really been um, like diving into death in the year before this happened and that the teachings of Krishnamurti were a part of that. Uh, but you've also told me a little bit about your your journeys with Amanita Muscaria. And I really want to hear more about this. Um, you know, it's the the iconic mushroom of all mushrooms. And like most people, I, I love so much their lore and what they represent. But also like most people, even people who have explored um, psychedelic mushrooms, I have not, I have no experience with Amanita. Uh, most of the mushrooms that people do are psilocybin. And Amanita is different. It's a really different experience from what I understand. And I'm very curious to hear your relationship with that mushroom. Yeah, I would love to share. Um, I'm so grateful, Amber. I just have to say, you know, when you first shared with me that your podcast was going to be on death, psychedelics and ancestry, I was just like, oh my God, I can totally roll with this. <laughs> So, um, yeah, let's talk about Mama Amanita. Um, so Augustine and I had came together and I will just share that, um, Augustine is definitely a fan of going deep, um, with psychedelic journeys. And I think that he's most interested in releasing fear of all sorts and fear of death and someone who, loves um like his favorite sorts of journey are the the sound and light deprivation journeys with high doses um, of psychedelics and I think those are the most potent for him and so when I met him you know I had definitely experienced um <clears throat> different kinds of psychedelics but this was in the first two weeks of us coming together that he was carrying um, some Amanita muscaria. And I was like, wow, isn't that the death cap? And, you know, that's what we're programmed uh, about this mushroom. There's so much fear surrounding it. I'm holding actually a cap in my hand right now, um, a dried cap that I had gifted to Augustine last Christmas. I got him a box of, of dried Amanita. Um, so I'm holding her in my hand right now. And um, so within the first week of us coming together, he, I, I really trusted him because he's had so many journeys and, you know, his journeys a lot of times uh, have been with babysitters. So someone who's there watching or, you know, just supporting him there. Um, but I, I really trusted him and he works really strongly with the I Ching and I had tuned in also and got a really clear, beautiful message about working with Amanita. So it was winter solstice in 2007, I believe. Um, and he gave me seven grams, which is a lot. And I would have never, if I would have known that at the time, I probably wouldn't have taken it because I like to start slow and then work my way up. But he gave me seven grams, which I'm so grateful that he did. And he didn't tell me. Um, and my experience with her isn't one of a trip, but one of more of connection. And so what, I tend to find with her is that she puts you right into the heart and there's definitely the time space collapse. And so um, we were up in my room. I remember at my family's house, they were gone. And what she does is like, you can be sitting up talking to someone and then all of a sudden just pass out. And that's kind of maybe why they might call her the death cap or why she could be a little bit dangerous is because, um, <clears throat> and I don't, I mean more of like a dream state. So like this isn't a mushroom that you want to work with and be walking around. Like we went downstairs to the fire and we had to crawl down the stairs. We actually couldn't stand up. Um, and once we got down to the fire, she's just, 
that experience was more of a dream state. So we would be up maybe meditating. And then the next thing you know, I'm waking up and I've been asleep for a half an hour or 20 minutes. And it's, it's like that. And your body goes into a full sweat and there's a lot of salivating and it's a deep cleanse. And it's also one that's really, um, she's just such potent heart medicine. And after that next day with her, um, I received a card in the mail from one of my sisters in New York. And I opened the card and it was a Christmas card, but on the cover was a big Amanita mushroom and it said, thank you. <laughs> and um, so I've had really beautiful experiences with her. And at the same time, there is a reason why she is called the death cap. And so I'm not in any way advoc advocating use with her. I think that it's best to work with someone who has a lot of experience with her first. Um, if, you, if someone was interested in journeying with her, and there's a lot of information online as well uh, that you can find. But with she's helped me uh, two times after that experience. That was Christmas. And then uh, there was another really potent experience with her. Uh, what we were doing was we were listening to Krishnamurti's talks on death and then um, working with the Amanita. And I was just, I think Augustine and I were so, that first year that we came together, part of our mission was just releasing fear. And, um, and so we were going deep. And we were also working strongly with Wachuma during that time. Um, which is the San Pedro cactus. And so with Wachuma and Amanita, I said, I would say that those have been my biggest heart openers with psychedelics, um, for sure. And so with the Amanita, um, what was happening when we were in New Zealand, when we were listening to the talks on death was just a complete time space collapse. And it, and it's hard to explain, you know, you mm -hmm. can't, I can't, it's hard to use words surrounding it. But, um, a few weeks after that, I believe is when I became pregnant with Naya and, and she was definitely a surprise. And so, um, Augustine asked if he could just have a day alone by himself. And, um, I went into town to do some stuff. And so that day, you know, I think that's kind of what happened. We were asking for our biggest fears to come forth and present themselves so that we could work through them. And for him, that was one of his biggest fears was having a child. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, he asked for a day alone. And that day he worked with Amanita and, those few days before that, when we first found out, I, you know, he was definitely in a lot of shock and I was pretty stoked because I've always wanted to have children and, and I didn't have those same fears around that. Um, and so when I came home that afternoon, he was just a different human and he was just grinning from ear to ear. And he said that Amanita had just given him the most beautiful physical sensation in his body and just shared with him that this was the most potent gift that he could give to himself and to me and to the planet was bringing forth this child together. And so I'm so grateful for mommy Amanita for helping to shift that because that was really challenging time for us those few days. Mm -hmm. And so I just love her and I haven't worked with her in a really long time. Um, but she's so special and she's not one to fear and she is also one to be very careful with. And, um, yeah, I think around that time also there was a patch that had sprouted up on the land we were living on. We were down on a community on the Coromandel called Karuna Falls. And that's where Naya was conceived. And um, there was a big ring that sprouted out around that time of Amanitas. And I remember Augustine took a couple of them. He had never done this before, but he had um, 
he had made them into a tea and that was a whole different story. I wasn't interested um, in drinking the tea and he basically was really, really sick for a full day, which makes sense. You're not supposed to take them um, in that way. They're supposed to be dried. Mm. And even we have always gotten them from a a botanical um, shop in Kansas and they're people that Augustine knows. Um, So, Definitely would never suggest taking them as a tea or without being dried beforehand. Mm. (laughs) Thank you. Um, Yeah, I'm always, always interested in hearing people's Amanita stories because it just does seem to work on on a different level than psilocybin. That's what everyone says. and. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe I'll experience it someday. I feel like the older I get, the um, the less I want or need to do psychedelics. I don't know. There's always something to learn. Um, mm-hmm. Actually, I guess I have a lot more fear now, too, to be honest, and a lot less space <laughs> in my Yeah, life. it's interesting. Whenever I'm going through something, that's the first thing Augustine's like, you need a journey. You need to go to journey and I'm like ah I can't this is definitely not the right time because Mm -hmm. I am in you know pain I am struggling Mm -hmm. but most of the time he's right Mm -hmm. (laughs) I think that when we are in those places um, these are such beautiful tools to help us move through and you know I went a long time without using any substances at all Um, I did a period of 10 years without drinking, working with any kind of um, plant medicines, and I needed to do that. And so now, even with alcohol, um, it's something that I use as medicine, and it's very rare. And when I do use it, including cannabis, um, I'd say like at this point with me, it's like a few times a year. And whenever I do, I'm, I'm always like, I should do this more. (laughs) Um, But yeah. 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 I I hardly ever um, smoke weed, but when I do, I'm always like, I should do this more often. (laughs) I feel really relaxed and creative right now. And I get way too in my like mom to do list business lady mode. Um, I know. Go ahead. I was just going to say that plant has been in my life since I was a child. Um, with my right. father, my papa. Um, I have, yeah, there's there's definitely some karma in my life with that plant because all of my partners have always had a really strong relationship. And, you know, I think we all go through this. We go through um, different times in our lives where we're working strongly with cannabis and other times when we're not. And so I, I feel really grateful to have found that balance now. We're at a good, a good point in our relationship. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, speaking of um, your father and your childhood, so I was really moved. I always love when you share about your childhood and like the um, the land that you grew up on. And preparing for this interview, I really liked learning about um, how, like, the your sort of ancestral foodways were sometimes reflected in the, like, hunting and gathering going on in your family growing up. And I did not know that you had um, Choctaw and Cherokee ancestry so so close to you. And so I'd love to hear about that. You specifically mentioned your great-grandpa Powell and his daughter, your grandma Lena, so mm-hmm. I, I just love to hear about them and any, any of the things we just talked about, how your dad grew up, your grandpa, your, yeah, all that, all that side. Yeah. Okay. I love talking about this because I have such a funny family. Um, but I first would love to share something that I learned from Havani Rios and um, her mother, Auntie Pua, who I've never met before, but I, since um, Mauna Kea on the big island of Hawaii. Um, Since everything surrounding that, I think I've really paid close attention to what's happening on the islands and especially um, 
with Havani. She shared a talk, which I would love to link. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll do that in the show notes. Okay. Um, that just moved me so deeply. And I really feel like the indigenous women during this time are the ones that we need to be listening to and the ones who are leading the way. And I've had such potent experiences um, listening to Havani speak and Lila June speak. And so I just want to call out these women and honor them and their work during this time right now, because it's so potent. And, um, and so she, Havani shared something during the time of Mauna Kea that really spoke to me. And so what, was, what is that? So Mauna Kea is the mountain on the big Island. And um, there is a telescope that they're trying to put in on the mountain. And so in 2015, um, there was a lot of protests surrounding um, the work um, of the telescope going up. And so you can look up, um, I'll link to that too, because it's really important that we're more aware of that. Um, So she had shared that It's also important if we don't know our ancestry or if we do to call out um, the land that raised us. So I'm just going to speak to that and share that I was raised on the land that the Lusuino Indians once called home. And the winds that raised me were the Santa Ana winds. And the water that raised me came from three ground wells within the town that I was raised in. The mountain that raised me was Big Bear Mountain. And the hills that surrounded my home were called the Norco Hills. And so I call out these resources. I call out, um, I call them out to give them life again. And so thank you to Havani for sharing this and the importance of this, of knowing where we come from, knowing the land that raised us. Um, And so I was raised in a small town called Norco in Southern California. And it's interesting because a lot of times people are like, Oh, Norco, it smells there. It's farmland. And so it doesn't really have the greatest, uh, it's just, I think too, like growing up, you know, going to the beaches, it's like the inland empire. Everyone's like, Ooh, Riverside. (laughs) But this town Norco is so special and it's, one of the biggest farming communities that's still happening. Um, I guess I wouldn't say farming so much anymore, but more it's a horse town. So we have horse trails there. There's no sidewalks. Um, You could ride your horses to school and there was an ag center there where you could keep your horses for the day. And um, so I love this town so much and it's changed a lot over the years, you know, and I don't get to go back there very much. I left when I was 18, but My dad is from Oklahoma, and so he came to California when he was 18, and my mom met him shortly after. And, you know, she was born and raised in California. And so he's a really interesting, my dad. He still has a really thick accent. He was raised um, with eight brothers and two sisters on a farm in Bokoshi, which is, um, like, close to Stigler, Oklahoma. Um, and it's like deep down in those parts of Oklahoma, like definitely the stories that come out of there from my dad are just crazy. I mean, definitely like oaky vibes (laughs) for sure. And, um, I feel like I have so much of that within me. (laughs) Um, Augustine makes fun of me a lot and he's from Kansas. So he's also from the Midwest, (laughs) but Um, so when my dad got out here and met my mom, he was also raised on a farm. And so he wanted to raise us in the same way. So we were raised on a farm there and we had every animal under the sun growing up from chickens, cows, pigs, goats, horses, pigs, all of it. Um, and he raised us in such a beautiful way. We had all of our meat came from our animals. So that that means if we were getting chickens, then that meant watching my dad and my uncles wring the chickens' necks. And, um, you know, I think the hardest part for me was becoming really close with our cows 
And then we had this guy, his name was Jim Hill, and he would come in his truck and, you know, kill the cows. And this happened all throughout my life until I was about, I think like when I was maybe like 12 or something, I was like, I can't do this anymore. Like, can we please stop? This is not okay. I just had a big wake up surrounding it all. And they did. Like once I was like really clear, like, I don't want, I don't want this anymore. I can't see this. I don't want to be a part of this. Then things shifted and they were getting the meat from my uncles. But, you know, my dad and his brothers were all hunters and, um, and fishermen. And that's because that's how they were raised. You know, my grandpa, he did this thing called, which I later found out is actually a thing. It's called Oki noodling, but I'd hear all these stories of like, you know, them holding on to my grandpa's legs and he would go down into the water to catch fish and then they'd pull him up catfish I think is what he was catching but there's so many stories I mean growing up we would have um the weirdest foods like squirrel snake whatever frog legs like I ate all that stuff growing up it was because my dad still had that in him so him and his brothers would just and I just thought that that was normal until I was older. And then I realized like, oh, wow, people don't actually eat squirrels and frog legs and all of those <laughs> things. And so I'm so grateful to be raised in that way with those foods. And, you know, with my grandma, my memories of her are of her shucking corn or peas, you know, beans. And I was definitely raised with the foods of my ancestors in that way with um, corn and squash and beans, the three sisters, we always had a huge garden, giant garden. All of our food came from the land there. And um, I just give thanks to my dad. You know, he really raised us in such a beautiful way. And he has such a close relationship to the earth. And I think at times it's been hard for my mom because I've looked to my dad for so much inspiration and she's inspired me in so many ways as well. But I have a something special with my dad and with his family and with that side, all of our family that's from Oklahoma. So they're from um, Choctaw territory down there. And so, yeah, my great grandfather, um, William Powell, he was half Choctaw, half Cherokee. And he has come to me so many times throughout my life. And I think the first time I ever saw a shaman, which is about 15 years ago, and the only time I've ever saw one um, was just surrounding. I, I didn't tell her while, why I was going there, but um, it was surrounding these headaches that I was having. And she shared with me, your grandfather on your father's side is here with you. And um she also shared about spider medicine being really present, the weaver, which at the time had a lot to do with, I think I've always been really crafty and loved making things. And um, so at the time, that was kind of what was present for me. And now it's so much more the spider medicine and the weaver has been, she's definitely been a big part of my life. But yeah, so... Um, my grandfather, he's definitely an, an ancestor that I connect to really strongly. And my grandmother, Lena, as well, his daughter. Um, yeah, so I, I definitely have a lot of the, that Oklahoma rootsy vibes running through my veins. Yeah, well, I think too, like your, uh, your online name for so long has been daughter of the sun which I always thought was just really beautiful and kind of all-encompassing and you're living in Hawaii and you have this big radiant smile and just like beautiful heart that shines outward but then you shared with me that that is actually the name of a, a Cherokee story so it was neat to know that that is also a part of your lineage mm -hmm. yeah it was a book that we had growing up and it had a lot of different Cherokee tales inside. And so that one was just always one that kind of stuck with me. Um, and so, yeah, that's how that name came forth. Um, 
I was also thinking about songs, songs of our ancestors. Um, and something that came forth with my dad's side was just, we didn't really learn a lot of songs growing up, but I know a lot of dirty nursery rhymes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that's one thing that can get people really rolling. I know so many dirty nursery rhymes that came from back in those parts. <laughs> Did your dad sing them to you when you were little? Oh, yeah, all the time. <laughs> and just especially around the fire. That's another thing you got mm. to share about my dad. So um, he has a really strong relationship with fire. And so growing up, our food was always really basic and it was meat, some kind of meat um, that he would grill over wood every night. And he still does this. And anyone that knows my dad knows about his barbecuing. He's really into barbecuing, but it's not like your typical like barbecue sauce. You know, it's like really amazing smoked meat and it's always with mesquite wood. Um, he's definitely not a fan of gas or charcoal or any of that. Mm. Um, and he, He's just incredible. My dad is amazing. I just love him so much. And he, um, yeah, he would, our meals were, you know, food from the garden and, and that meat that my dad still makes all the time. Um, yeah. It's, it's really inspiring to me to hear someone living in the modern world eating and gathering food like that because, um, you know, like a lot of people I'm getting a lot more serious about like self-sufficiency -suff and resiliency and you and I both, uh, you with the newly acquired Spirit Weavers land in Oregon and me here in Northern California went through some major fire scares this summer Mm. And we know those are just going to keep happening. And, mm. you know, I mean, a lot of other disasters, pandemics, things that could happen in the future. Um, I'm really thinking about like preparedness, you know, people call it prepping. I like to call it getting preppy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it, it seems really overwhelming, especially the food part. Um, you know, obviously, like I buy almost all my food from the grocery store. We have a, a garden, too. But it's really inspiring to be like, oh, there are people like Americans you know, living in the modern world who just incorporate that way of nourishing themselves into their daily lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And he, he takes walks every day. He doesn't miss. He goes out. There's a, it's called the Santa Rosa Plateau out there. They live in um, Marietta now and he walks out there for an hour or so every day. And He's been a really big inspiration in my life in many ways, my papa. Well, I love the story that I've seen you share online, too, that um, he had or has, I don't know, a printing business. And when you were little, when you'd get, like, really excited about an idea, he'd print you up some business cards. <laughs> yeah, totally. So that's another interesting thing is I've always had these little businesses. And, like, growing up, I had, like, a nail salon or – I would, I don't know. I just always had these business ideas and he would, um, I had a library, I had a flower shop and yeah, he would print me up business cards. Um, and it's interesting too, because his, the printing industry has changed so much with the age of, you know, the internet and things. And so now a lot of his clients are letterpress, um, people who, who work work with letterpress and a lot of them are women and it's really cool so he'll go to these conventions of printing and letterpress and um he's always has you know stories that he's sharing with me about all that but yeah he's he's definitely helped me with all of my businesses and it and he's just been a big inspiration in that way as well he's had his business for 30 years and he definitely came from a poor family and um he, you know, started this business 30 years ago, just some like random thing that he was doing, um, working, he makes, he manufactures rubber rollers for printing presses. It's like a really weird thing mm -hmm. that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I'm so proud of him because he really came from nothing and he's made a beautiful life for himself and his family. Well, and it seems like that must have been really empowering for you growing up to just have a business mm -hmm. card made. Like I, I, you know, yeah, that must have. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And my mom too, she was 
part of it as well. She did all the bookkeeping for a long time. She still does. It's definitely a family business. Both of my brothers, my older brother and my younger brother, both work still for the company. Um, and so I was, I was raised with that as well. So I think that that's made it a little bit easier for me to um, just have confidence to start my own business, you know, and I think it, it started early on with, um, with jewelry design and working with leather. That's what I was doing in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And Uh, that's how I found you. Yeah. Was through Alila. Um, Yeah. Sorry Mm -hmm. to interrupt you, but I was just thinking about that story earlier. It was, um, she was modeling for my vintage clothing shop and this was on the winter solstice, I think 2008, because I just started the shop and she was wearing this gorgeous leather necklace and I complimented it and she was like, oh, my friend Amy made it. You should check out Daughter of the Sun. And I did, you know, because it's a really easy name to remember. (laughs) I think found your Etsy shop and then found my way over to your blog and, um, and that's how we first connected. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have a lot of similarities, Amber. We have a lot of a lot of things in our life. Um, alcoholism being one of them with our family. That's another thing. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot to dive into. But um, <laughs> yeah. I was thinking about with, that too. Yeah, with with my beautiful family also comes alcohol, and they are loving alcoholics and it's sensitive for them you know they're definitely um they just enjoy, they enjoy drinking you mm-hmm. know in the evenings and the weekends and it's always been like that my whole life I've had like my house was a house where everyone tried their first whatever it was mm-hmm. and they've always been um really open and open in so many ways and so you know there's there's good and I guess the positive and the negative surrounding things. And at this point in my life, um, it's, I've surrendered that this is their life and this is, you know, they're definitely happy people. I'd say like happy drunks, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and they enjoy it. And so I have to release, you know, any of my judgment surrounding that. And I have, Um, But it has been my whole life and it has been, that has been my main struggle with my family. Um, But I'm to a point now where, as I shared, I have released so much of that. And, um, you know, we all have our shit. And that's just, that's one of the struggles that I have, that I have had in the past with them. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I want to... um... To just honor them, too, for raising someone who has made such a huge impact on the world. Like, it's one thing to start a business with your leather goods, but then to start the Spirit Weavers Gathering and to have seen it through, like, is this the sixth year coming up? Or Mm -hmm. Yeah, this will be our sixth year. And it just has exploded, has grown so much. It has changed form. I feel like if it were me, I would for sure have quit by now. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. For sure. (laughs) Um, But you see it through. Like you have this long-term vision and you get the support you need and you figure it out. And it has made this incredible impact on so many women's lives. Thank you, Amber. Well, we're all doing this together. I always say that because it's really, it's so true. You know, we couldn't do this without each other. And so um, I think for me, something that's really helped me um, throughout my whole life is just sticking to a vision and seeing it through. I'm, I feel like I can say that I'm really good at Um, making things happen and so um, you know challenges come up boundaries get in the way but there's always a way around them and I think that you know that's how we grow that's how we expand is is working through the challenges listening to others um, and just continuing to say yes and yeah it's been both beautiful and challenging and that's life, you know, or living in duality consciousness. So, um, yeah, I'm, I, it's hard to see all of what you're sharing because I'm so in like the depth of it and Mm -hmm. the heart of it. And so, um, it's good for me to hear those things and it's good 
for me to hear women's experience surrounding the gathering because it reminds me that it is important work and it reminds me to keep going because yeah there are times where I'm like I can't do this I'm like haven't spent time with my family in a week or you know Mm -hmm. there's definitely challenges surrounding it um but there is also so much beauty within it as well and that's what's important and that's what keeps keeps me going and and motivated and yeah just having land now just feels like a whole new level and I'm really excited. Yeah. And that's be. huge. You, you really took a yeah. leap in getting funding and buying a piece of land for the gathering. And it seems, it feels so right. And I'm so proud of you. Oh, thank you, Amber. Yeah. It's definitely one of the scariest things I've ever done. I think the first day I shared this story at um, the gathering. I'll just share it really quickly. But the first day that we arrived to the land after we had gotten the keys, my mom was with me and my younger brother, Melvin. And I was so, I had so much anxiety in my body of just like, what did I just do? I don't, I'm never going to be able to pull this off. And I just had to have my mom, I asked my mom, can you just hold me in your arms and let me cry and tell me everything is going to be okay and she did she just held me while I cried and I was just like oh my it's okay you know we'll get through this everything's going to be fine and and it has been it's it's you know I think just pushing through that fear and I do want to give thanks to these three incredible cedar trees that live on that land there because they are the reason that I said yes to that land. They came to me um, during a night when I was experiencing a lot of anxiety when I found out that this loan that we were going to get had all these like hidden, you know, fees and all these things. And I was just like, okay, we can't do it. And that night um, I had taken some CBD oil that, actually worked real you know usually when I've taken it in the past I don't feel much but because my body was experiencing so much anxiety that night that that is when that medicine really worked for me it just went in there and it helped me so much so it was a combination of the CBD oil those three cedar trees and Lila June I was listening to her podcast um, with Ayana from For the Wild that night And I was just in tears in my bed and listening to Lila June's words. um, Those three cedar trees came to me and they told me, this is not about you. This is not about the gathering. This is about us. And we need you to come here. We need you here. And we are in danger. And that just woke me. And I was just like, okay, there's no, we don't have a choice. We have to do this. And and we did, and I just, uh, I'm, I have one of the cedar trees, one of the little branches right here in my hand right now, and I just grabbed those cedar trees that night, and I just uh, was just cleansing my body with them, and so, you know, listen, listen to the nature around you, because there's so much that it has to share, and So, yes, thank you to those beautiful cedar trees for coming to me. And we're putting the land um, in a conservation easement so that it can never be developed um, or touched. And so um, it's 100 acres, and right next to it is another 60 acres that's also in an easement. And so we're going to have a total of 160 acres there. Um, It's just beautiful, pure, pristine, forested land that will always remain that way. Wow. I love hearing that. Um, I also have some cedar in my hand right now. As I was walking into my little room here to speak with you, there's a cedar right outside. And I thought about, I hadn't heard that story, but you had told me that these cedars, you know, helped you make that decision. And I thought about you and I grabbed the cedar and I'm smelling it as you tell that story. Um, I That's a great episode of the For the Wild podcast with Lila June mm-hmm. that introduced me to her work and would definitely recommend that to people. And so here you are, like, um, like the shamanic healer said to you all those years ago, the 
the spider weaving weaving the web, bringing all of these different threads together and sort of being the central person around which all this beautiful healing for land and humans is happening. Hmm. Yeah, it seems it seems like it's it's happening for a lot of us right now. I think it's our age too. Like I just turned 40 this year and um, I think it's just that time when we say yes to, Mm -hmm. to buying land and stepping into that role as caretakers, land stewards. Yeah. Yeah. And I appreciate too. It seems like um, the spirit weavers gathering, I mean, you always focused on that, but has, turned even more so to really focus on like land stewardship and um indigenous wisdom indigenous rights social justice and it's just it's beautiful to see that i think you're um initiating a lot of people into the paths that they will walk for the rest of their lives that will really make a difference in the world Mm, thank you amber yeah i think it's it's time for us to sit back and listen and i think that that that's key is um is just listening because we've been talking and we've been we've been going about the wrong way for too long and so it's time for us to step aside and there's there's a lot of wisdom that needs to be shared and so a lot of listening yeah thank you and thank you so much for talking to me today. I'm so glad we got to connect and I can't wait to uh, share this conversation with others. Thank you, Amber. I'm really, really happy to join you here today. And um, yeah, thank you for being such a beautiful, inspiring human for all of us as well. I'm really, really grateful that you're doing this podcast. I know you've, you have been into podcasts for a long time. So it feels really good to celebrate this with you. Thank you. That's true. I love podcasts. <laughs> Thank you for taking these medicine stories in. I hope they inspire you to keep walking the mythic path of your own unfolding self. I love sharing information and will always put any relevant links in the show notes. You can find my blog, Handmade Herbal Medicines, and a lot more at mythicmedicine.love. While you're there, be sure to click the black banner across the top of the page to take my quiz, Which Magical Herb is Your Spirit Plant? It's a fun and lighthearted quiz, but the results are really in-depth and designed to bring you into closer alignment with the medicine that you're in need of. If you love the show, please consider supporting my work at patreon.com slash medicine stories. Um, there's some cool rewards there, like exclusive content, free access to my herbal ebook and online course, and the ability to chat with me. I am a crazy busy and overwhelmed mom and adding another project into my life with this podcast is a questionable move, but I'm also so excited about it and just praying that the Patreon will allow me the financial wiggle room to keep doing it. Another way that you can support if that's not an option is to head over to iTunes and subscribe and review the podcast. That would be super helpful. Thank you. And thank you to Marie Sue for providing the music that I use. That's Marie with two E's, S-I-O-U-X. This is from her song, Wild Eyes, one of my favorites. Uh, Check out Marie Sue. Beautiful music. Thank you, and I look forward to next time. Bye.